uh, Jamie Regal, I tell you, uh, if you've ever heard him, you know what laughing is. He has the greatest gift of humor and as well as a, a, a great preacher of the gospel. So thank you, Jamie, for being here tonight. And thank all of you. It does remind me of our Real Evangelism Conference. It's about 14 years here. And this wonderful, unselfish church sponsored us when we had it at another location. And uh, anything Mike Whitson is in charge of is going to be unselfish. It really will be. And um, I did not learn until last week that this church had called uh, the hotel where I've been staying some in Houston. And uh, they had that uh, hotel to put a, a good, sizable gift on our bill. And uh, I mean, it didn't add to our bill, but took away from our bill. <laughs> and uh, some other people have been adding to it. But uh, uh, that, that's the way he is. And uh, I've said this, he, he's probably gonna wish I wouldn't say it, but I'm gonna say it. I've never known anybody who rejoiced more in other, pers other people's good fortune than uh, Mike Whitson. And I believe that. And um, so, um, so uh, it's a joy to be with him. I've been coming to this church more than 30 years, even preached in the old uh, little building, and this church has just so grown over the years. Sammy, are you in here right now? Sammy, would you stand just a minute? Uh, I, I'm sorry, you can go ahead and be seated back, but I want them to see who, who you. Well, he was waving banners and wanted to get noticed, and uh, no. I, w I wanted to say to Sammy Thomas, Sammy, very few people have preached in more Baptist churches than I have. And I believe you're the best second man in the Southern Baptist Convention. I believe that. He's uh, that, that kind of a, of a person. Uh, I have an unusual joy here tonight. My favorite relative here is Don Lucky. Don, raise your hand. Next to him is Josh Spears a fine young preacher friend of mine, and I've got to quit noticing people and start preaching. Now, bro Brother Mike mentioned those years I was president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, they were very difficult years. Somebody said, how was I doing? I said, I've been sleeping like a baby. Sleep a while, cry a while, sleep a while, cry a while. <laughs> and uh, very controversial years, and because I believe the Bible and speak it, I was constantly in trouble. Uh, but, but just busy, flying, flying, flying. And uh, one day I came by my office to get an airplane ticket. And my secretary, Marge Malone, who was John Bassanio's secretary, uh, Jimmy Draper's secretary, my brother-in-law, Tom Ellis' secretary, she said, Preacher, I'm glad you came by. Uh, this is a holiday week, and uh, we're printing the bulletin a day early, and we need your sermon title for Sunday. I said, Marge, I don't know what I'm preaching Sunday. She said, it's Thursday, you've got to know. I said, sometime on Saturday, I don't know. <laughs> she said, you, well, you've got to give us something. I said, look, just put Sunday morning, the pastor speaks. <laughs> just put Sunday morning, the pastor speaks. She said, well, how about Sunday night? I said, now Sunday night, you're a little bit more in luck. I'm preaching out of Psalm 14 where it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And uh, she said, what's that? I said, Psalm 14, you've heard preachers use it all of their life. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. She said, what's your title for Sunday night? I said, I don't know, you make up one. <laughs> well, I go to Nashville, get back from my trip, come up to and sit in the little preacher's chair, picked up the bulletin and it said this, Sunday morning, the pastor speaks. Sunday night, what the fool said. <laughs> Never let your secretary pick out your sermon title, all right? Take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Genesis. I recently preached this message at First Baptist Dallas, Texas. Dr. Jimmy Draper said, Bailey, that message needs to be preached 
in every state convention of our denomination. Uh, not that it's a good sermon, but it does have a needed message. Now, the scripture reading is unusual. We're going to read the latter part of the scripture first, and you'll see why. So if you look at this passage in Genesis 19, Genesis 19, verse 36, it is, it is one of the saddest statements on incestuous sex that you read in all of literature. I didn't say in all the Bible, but in all of literature. Thus were both of the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, when you are the father of your own grandchildren, and you have done something very horrible. Here Lot was a man that had seen great movements of God. His uncle, you all know, was Abraham. He had literally seen visions of angels from heaven. And yet here the Bible says he had sexual intercourse and produced children from his own children. What a horrible thing to read in the Bible. Now how could a man go from such spiritual heights to great movements of God to great wonderful glorious moments to go into bed with his own daughters and of course other verses there explain how they drink wine and other things happen but the horrible truth is a man did something absolutely unthinkable. Now how could you go from that uh, horrible, horrible experience from, from, from the wonderful things he had to doing that? Well, the answer is, go back, if you will, toward the front of your Bible to Genesis 13. And we're going to read verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the journey of Jordan the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and dwelt, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Now I want you to hear this sentence. And he pitched his tent toward Sodom. How do you go from seeing visions of God and visitations of angels? How do you go from having moments of great spiritual conversation with Uncle Abraham. How can you do all of that and then become the father of your own grandchildren? Because he pitched his tent toward Sodom. All he did was leaned himself toward lunacy. He positioned himself toward disaster. And it, was, it didn't take much to push him over the edge because he was positioned in that way. Now, if I stand right here, a five-year-old could come and push me off of these steps. But if I were to go back here and maybe get behind this choir, it, may, it might take some pretty strong men a few minutes to get me off. But the closer I would stand to the edge, the easier it would be for somebody to push me off. Now, there's some of you right now that are going to be easy for the devil to push off because you have pitched your tent toward Sodom. I've entitled the message, Tilted Toward Tragedy. I read the other day in USA Today newspaper, it said something that caught my eye. 600 bridges in America will collapse, listen to this, because of existing problems. The uh, steel of the bridge does not have to be compromised. No 18-wheelers have to drive across it. No tornado has to hit the bridge. 600 bridges in America will collapse because of existing problems. I wonder if already in some of you looking at me, there is inside of you something that already exists that will inevitab inevitably destroy you. I preached this message in Missouri a state director came up to me weeping and he said, preacher, I've been tilted toward tragedy a long time. And he said, I, I was about to fall. 
Thank you for telling me the truth. Seated in my office in Oklahoma, my secretary told me my appointment was there. A family came in, a husband and wife, and they could not speak for their crying. And then they said, preacher, let us get our composure. They said, you've been in our home off of Anderson Road. I said, I have. They said, well, preacher, we need to tell you something. Our neighbor across the street and my wife work within two blocks of each other in downtown Oklahoma City. And one day our neighbor came across the street and he said, look, there's no reason for us to burn two tanks of gasoline. Why don't sometime I'll ride with, in your wife's car and then other times she'll ride with me. They thought that was a good economic idea. So they started doing that. And the man across the street and the man's wife, the other man's wife would ride together to work. Yeah, it happened. They had an affair. And I looked at them and I said, are you surprised? Well, their head was kind of bowed, but when I said that, they did this. They said, what do you mean? Are we surprised? I said, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. You put yourself in a position you should have never put yourself in, into. You don't allow something like that to happen. Folks, let me just tell you this. If you don't plan to go in the front in the house, stay off the front porch. And they put themselves on the front porch of disaster. And it was a horrible, tragic mistake. There, there existed in them something that brought the marriages to an end. Bob Harrington was one of the finest evangelists, Jamie, that ever lived in the Southern Baptist Convention. I remember having him and at 5.30 the church would be full. He called himself the chaplain of Bourbon Street. And he'd always talk about his office between, between on Bourbon Street, between the show bar and the Hotsy Totsy. And he said he'd built his office at the gates of hell. You can't do that. You can't do that. And neither could he. He lost his family. He heard me preach this at Dr. Falwell's super conference and he came up to me and he was not crying. His face looked like he had just washed it. He says, Bailey, preach that every place that you go because you cannot build your office in the gates of hell and survive. He said, I was not only tilted toward tragedy, he said, I was leaning toward lunacy. I was way, way over the line. And he said, preach that every place you go. And I've tried to do that. Now I want to show you some signs tonight because already some of you have guilt on your faces because you know you're tilted toward tragedy. But I, I, I want to show you some indications how to know if you're tilted toward tragedy. Number one, a casualness about sin. A casualness about sin. That was Bob's problem. Oh, it didn't matter that it was the show bar, the hotsy totsy, or there were topless girls around. I mean, after all, he was saved. He knew Jesus. He felt like he was protected by the helmet of salvation and uh, the shield of God's wonderful grace. But here he was in, in an environment that he could not overcome. He had just pitched his tent toward Sodom. I read a little article some time ago. You know what the title of it was? True story. Pet Lion Mauls Five-Year-Old. There's no such thing as a pet lion. Jack Hanna, the most famous zookeeper in all of the, of the world, Columbus Zoo. He calls himself Jungle Jim on television. Jack Hanna said something that I think you need to write down if you can't remember it. Now, he probably knows more about animals and keeping animals and training animals than anybody on earth. And Jack Hanna, normally he's got his jungle type clothes on. Jack Hanna said this. He said, you can train a wild animal, but you can't tame a wild animal. You can train your sin. You can train your sin, put it aside for a while, but you can't tame it. One day it'll come out of the closet and it'll snatch you by the neck 
and with its gnarled teeth, it'll drag you off into obscurity and nobody will ever care about you again. Because you can train a wild animal, but you can't tame one. You can train your sin, but you can't tame one. In New York City, you might remember years ago when the pandas came to America, the pandas, the cute little black and white, white bears. They came to our city of Atlanta for a while, but then they went to New York City. And uh, everybody thought they were so cute, and they are. Well, two boys who didn't have a lot of money went to see the pandas, and one of them said, hey, look at the pandas, they've got a pool. We're, we're not rich kids. Let's come over tonight and swim in the panda pool. The other boy said, you gotta be crazy. You, 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 man, we, we, we can't, he said, look, they're pandas. They're just pandas. So he talked the other boy in doing it. They climbed over the fence at night. Well, the pandas who were back heard the thrashing around. They came out. One boy escaped over the fence, but the other boy was disemboweled. They said there was hardly enough to recognize him as a human being. And I, I guess the boy that suggested they go and swim in the panda pool, I guess he was thinking about the little black and white fuzzy thing you buy at Walmart. I guess he really wasn't understanding they were wild animals, that they were bears. And what a terrible, terrible experience to go through. And, and, and I remember reading that statement, it's only a panda. It's only a bear. It's only an R-rated movie. It's only a magazine. It's only. Yeah, it's only the thing that will destroy your relationship to Jesus Christ. You remember the cathedrals had a song. Most of you could repeat this. But the song said this, you'll remember it. Sin will take you further than you want to stray. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Cost you more than you want to pay. How true that is. And the heartbreak of those who have had to learn the hard way, no, it's not just a panda. It's a sin. And it's a sin that will destroy you. You've trained that sin, but you cannot tame it. So when there is a casualness about sin, you've tilted your tent towards Sodom, one of the uh, finest preachers, Cliff Barris, told me one time that God meant for this preacher, his name was Jack Schuler, uh, that God meant for Jack Schuler to be what Billy Graham became. Jack Schuler was handsome, man, good looking. And um, I, I used to go hear him a lot with, with Don Lucky and, and um, the National Association of, of Christian Doctors asked me to be their speaker one year. And uh, I told the story about Jack Schuler being one of the finest preachers that ever lived. I'm extremely handsome. I forgot who played Elliot Ness on television, The Untouchables, but he looked like that guy. Robert Stack, that's his name. And, and, and he looked like him. Man, handsome. And, and a brilliant, eloquent, powerful preacher. Thousands of people would respond. And Finally, somebody talked him into social drinking. It's only a social drink. It's only a panda. It's only a social drink. It's only a beer. It's only a cocktail. And the man died a drunk. When I told that story, a man came up afterwards and handed me a car and it said, Dr. Jack Schuler. I said, are you the son of the man I just talked about? He said, Brother Smith, I am. And he said, you told the truth. My daddy was one of the most gifted men that ever lived, but he died a drunk because he started out just as a social drinker. As you know, alcoholics are not made, they're born because alcoholics are born with a propensity toward alcoholism. And that's what this great evangelist forgot about. And he died ashamed of his life. What a tragic casualness about sin. But secondly, a contempt for saints. Man, I'm seeing that everywhere. You see, when revivals repulse you, 
and chastity chafes you, and godliness galls you, and praise tricks you, and fellowship frustrates you, you're headed downward. You have a contempt for the things of God. If I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but when I saw this crowd tonight, I realized the same crowd could be here on Sunday nights. What's happened to Sunday night? I tell you what kills Sunday night, Sunday morning. Who wants that twice in a day? <laughs> but what I'm saying to you, when you start picking and choosing what you're going to do in the work of Christ, we know better when this building is full on a Sunday morning and you have a handful on a Sunday night, you chose the world over Jesus. You say, is that harsh? I hope so, I'm trying to be. Folks, I'm telling you, unless we have a revival of activity and a revival of a commitment and a, lot, and a revival for the things of God, then the church of Jesus Christ will not survive. Everybody tell us, go ahead. Every now and then somebody says, oh, Brother Bailey, you don't have to worry about it. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What a joke. What the gates of hell could not do, compromising preachers and lazy church members has already done. We don't need the gates of hell. We could do it without them. I was preaching in First Baptist Moscow, Russia, where Billy Graham preached a lot of times. And that morning it was raining and the building was packed, people were standing, every aisle was full, mostly of older women with scarves on. And, um, and, and I, I looked out of a window and I could tell that there was a line and it, it did like this outside the church in rain. And I said to the pastor, Brother Bishkov, I said, uh, you're not allowed to have a PA system, are you, outside? In Russia, are you? He said, no, no. I said, well, what are those people doing standing out in the rain? He said, Brother Smith, did you notice that our um, people had their hands on the shoulder of the person in front of them all the way down each aisle? I said, yes, sir, I noticed. He said, well, not only was that in the church, but it was all the way down because the line outside the church is two blocks. They cannot hear what's going on. But if they can touch somebody who's touching somebody, who's touching somebody, who's touching somebody, they're just grateful they got that close to the gospel. And I said, oh, if we could just get that spirit back in America again. If we could just get that back again. Beware when a person starts having a contempt for saints. We don't need to go on Sunday night. We don't need to go on Wednesday night. We don't need to go to a choir special. Well. You don't, but you're headed downward. Thirdly, here's another indication you're tilted toward tragedy. A complacency with scripture. So many of our more charismatic brethren have fallen morally. Um, I, I'm amazed at some of them. There was one, <laughs> I mean, he is laying hands on, hands on everybody. They're slaying in the spirit. He's got a wig on. That's the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. It looks like a rabbit crawled up there and died. And he wears these big glasses. And he's praying for all of these people to be healed. Well, why, why did he pray for hair? In fact, if somebody wants to come up here and pray for me here right now, I'll take it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, he, he can't see, he can't grow hair, but he can heal polio, tuberculosis, cancer. And, and so many of those men fall because they, they play fast and loose with the scripture. Do you, do you realize the one reason Jimmy Draper said to me what he said, we have had four professors 
one of them, a dear friend of mine, Southeastern Seminary, fired in the last three months because of moral failure. Four. I'm not talking about atheists and agnostics. I'm talking about men that were not only called to preach, but called to teach the gospel. Fall. You know why? They got a little complacent with the scripture. And they just fell. A dear friend of mine went through a tragedy that I will never forget. His wife was having an affair with a 50-year-old deacon, pastor of a First Baptist Church in the state of Georgia. He called me one day and he said, Bailey, I just bought a 38. I'm going to go kill that. And he used words I cannot use at this place. I said to that man, I said, don't do it. He said, yeah, I'm going to shoot that so-and-so. I said, don't do it. Don't do it. He would tell you today that I talked him out of being a murderer. I said, can you tell me about your wife's journey? He said, Bailey, there was a day when I would come in and my wife would be having some coffee and reading her Bible. She read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible. Then all of a sudden the Bible was missing and stacked by her chair were Western novels. And I said, even the covers were too embarrassing to look at. And all of a sudden she went from the word of God to Western novels and she could not take it. And she had an affair with this 50 year old man. And he said, I wanted to kill that son of a, but he said, I, 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 I'm, so, I, I, I'm so glad you talked me out of it because I, I know I would regret it. The man today is still a friend of mine and I'm telling you the marriage survived. The marriage survived. But she became fast and loose with the scripture, the word of God. Let me tell you, if you ever become an insomniac you just can't sleep at night. Start reading the Bible and the devil will put you to sleep. Because <laughs> he doesn't want you to be fed on this word. He doesn't want you to get any of this. What, what a tragedy. The pastor told me today at dinner time that there'd be a lot of preachers here tonight. Well, preachers, let me tell you something. If this book is the means by which you make your living, instead of the manual by how you live your life, you're in trouble. And there's some men who read this Bible to make a living. Pick it up when they're going to do a revival. Pick it up when they're going to preach to get paid for. I love what a man said who learned it was better to preach the Bible than trying to impress intellectual people. He said, yesterday I preached my much learning and all the scholars came up and praised me, but today I preached Jesus Christ and him crucified and all the sinners came up and thanked me. Amen. Oh God, give us the kind of preaching where the lost man, the drunk, the prostitute, the homosexual will walk into a church and they will leave change by the power of the living God preached by a man who would not change. And then comfortable with self. That's number four. We get so, we get so comfortable with ourselves and thinking we can't do anything wrong. Everything's going to be fine. And we just kind of let it go at that. Tragic. <laughs> when I was pastor at Dell City, Oklahoma, uh, we had an 8.30 service and 11 o'clock service. And uh, Jake Self, who's an associate for the same pastors I mentioned a while ago, Draper, Bassanio, and Ella. Brother Jake was, came out of the oil field. He still had some oil field habits. And if he ever got mad at me, I knew it. And uh, he didn't have any ecclesiastical language, I promise you. But he was a great associate pastor. Well, between 8.30 and 11 o'clock service, we would come to our office and Brother Jake would make coffee and we'd drink coffee and then we'd go to the 11 o'clock service. Well, he'd been at the 8.30 service. And uh, so he brings me a cup of coffee and he takes his hands like this. I'm sitting in my day and does like this and he leans over. He said, Brother Bailey, look at me. 
I said, yes. He said, are you looking at me? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're an idiot. I said, um, well, I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> and this was before Joel Osteen, I mean, could have helped him, so. <laughs> I said, Brother Jake, why are you calling me an idiot? He said, you got up and said today that no woman had really seriously come against you. Don't you know the devil cannot read your mind? but he can hear your words and you just announce to him that you're a target. Just in the next year, and I have my wife's permission to tell this, three women became very aggressive toward me. One of them extremely aggressive and she'd call our home and I just put Sandy on the line. I said, talk to her. She'd say, well, I, I'm, in, I'm in love with your husband. She said, I'm sorry, but he's taken. I was with my son Scott at a church in Warner Robins, Georgia, and I was packing up my books, and this attractive lady comes up to me, and she just looks around and she says, go home with me tonight. She didn't know my son Scott was standing over here. Well, I, I spoke to her very harshly. I spoke to her very plainly, where she walked off in a huff, and Scott came up to me and he said, Daddy, you were rude to that woman. I said, I meant to be because I didn't want to leave any bit of room that she might have a chance with me. When I said yes to Sandy Smith, I was taken. And I was committed to her and shall be all of my life. But Brother Jake was right. I was an idiot for saying that. Because you've just announced to the devil, you're a target. You're a target. And when you become so comfortable with yourself, then you're, you're in deep trouble. And you see, the problem is that the opposite sex is attractive. Do I think women are pretty? Most of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, This just barely fits in, but it fits. <laughs> this woman came to me wanting to counsel. She worked at a bank, and uh, this vice president wanted her to travel with her, she told me. And she said, you know what he expects from me when we travel? And said, but he's been so good to me, I just feel like I gotta keep doing it. I said, oh, you got your sugar daddy. Well, yeah, he's bought me a lot of great things. And uh, she was just marginally attractive. And um, <laughs> so I said, so you feel, you feel obligated to sleep with him because he buys you all of these things. And she said, yes. And I started thinking of going to the Bahamas, BFWs, furs. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, what, is he, what has he bought you lately? She said, well, he just bought me a weed eater last week. Sometimes the devil makes it real easy. <laughs> My associate pastor in Arkansas was Brother Lee Lewis, and he said an interesting thing to me one day. He said, he asked his 81-year-old uh, daddy, he said, Daddy, how old do you have to be to quit noticing women? He says, Son, I don't know. You'll have to ask somebody older. And folks, may I tell you something? I'll be 80 in a few months. <laughs> You'll have to ask somebody older. <laughs> one, one, one man said to his wife, honey, I'm having lunch with Evelyn tomorrow, but we're just talking about our computer system. 
She said, Fred, don't do it. We're, we're, just, having, we're just having lunch together. You, you know, Evelyn, don't do it, Fred, don't do it. And then the man tried to defend himself, but what the woman said to him, everybody here needs to listen to, including me. He said to his wife, honey, don't you trust me? She said, Fred, I trust you, but I don't trust the flesh. I trust Bailey Smith, but I don't trust his flesh. Let me say this as delicately as I can. When the male anatomy is aroused, it's probably too late to turn back. And when you are so tilted toward tragedy that you put yourself in a position for arousal, then it may be too late to turn back. And what a tragedy it is to get so comfortable with ourselves that we make these kinds of mistakes. I, um, are the Harris's here tonight? Because they know these people I'm talking about. Uh, they were my board members. They made a lot of money. Well, one of the board members' wives, because they had a lot of money, she wanted a personal trainer. Now, this woman was thin. Where I grew up, they'd call her skinny. And she wanted a personal trainer down at the spa. I mean, she was so skinny, one day she got a run in her hose and fell out. But she had to have a personal trainer. So since they had millions of dollars and they still have millions of dollars, he got her a personal trainer. Guess what else she got? Yeah, a new husband. <laughs> he called me and he, he, was just, he was just weeping. Brother Bailey, I don't know how this could happen to me. I said, you did a foolish thing. You don't let some man give your wife a massage. You say, well, I think you're narrow-minded. Well, I think you're stupid. <laughs> Do you think my wife would allow some man to give her a massage? Absolutely not. I have bought her at Seidel Spa in, for Christmas a, a massage, but she always puts on there female to do the massaging. Because when you allow some man do a massage on your wife, you're tilted toward tragedy. You, you, you made a dumb mistake in your life, a tragic mistake. God help us. Let me say number five. What's another indication you're tilted toward tragedy? When you start coasting in service. You know, when you're coasting, you can only go one direction, down. And some of you kind of quit on God. You think you know enough Bible, you've been to church enough, and so you're going to coast. Well, if you coast, you can only go one direction. You can't ever read enough Bible. You can't ever be in church too much. You can't ever do the things of God enough. It's interesting sometimes when you see the progression down of somebody that ought to be growing in the Lord. Think about David. Now listen to this. Don't ever forget it. When David was a boy, he killed a lion, he killed a giant, and he killed a bear when he was a boy. But when he got to be king, he committed adultery and murder because he thought he could coast. As a boy, he killed a lion, a bear, and a giant. But when he got to be king, he committed adultery and and murder. Don't ever put yourself on the throne of your life. Put Jesus there because you'll never get to the point where you can coast. It's interesting when you read the life of Noah. Of all the great things Noah did, but of all the things that Noah did, you know what it says about Noah? The last 400 years of his life. Now, when Noah had an ark to build, he was busy. He was preaching. He was involved. 
But the last 400 years of Noah's life, the only thing the Bible says about Noah was he got naked and he got drunk. Noah, Noah. Now, of course, if you've been in a building program 100 years, you've got a right to get naked and drunk. But I'm telling you something you must never forget. Don't ever get to the point where you think you've done enough. You've got to do more. You've got to set bigger goals. You just never quit. Noah quit. The ark was done. And Noah, the last four, can you imagine? 400 years, the only thing the Bible can say about you is that you got naked and drunk and maybe, maybe, maybe had a homosexual relationship while you were in a slumber. There's argue, argument about that, but there's enough argument to make you think it could be so. My we, son, Josh, and I went to um, Pennsylvania. We were doing a crusade near um, Niagara Falls. And... Um, one day we went over to Niagara Falls and there was a buzz because the day before people saw a tragic thing. They saw the carcass of a sheep floating down Niagara River and an eagle comes and this eagle lands on the carcass of a floating sheep and it puts its talons into the carcass of the frozen sheep. And everybody thought that would be fine because an eagle is an eagle. An eagle is an eagle. And it can muster up enough power any time to extricate itself from that. But they said the eagle, when it got close to the great precipice, the great Niagara Falls, they saw the eagle put out its beautiful plumes. You could tell it was doing everything to marshal its resources, to free itself before the dead sheep and itself went over the falls. But he said when that eagle stretched every part of his body and tried to fly away, that his, his claws had gotten stuck in the frozen wool of that sheep and they went over together to the, de to the death of that eagle. You know, a lot of preachers get their claws into things they wish they never had. So do deacons. So do deacons' wives. What I'm trying to tell you is stay away from the river of tragedy in the first place. Don't be tilted toward tragedy. Don't get close to disaster. The Bible doesn't say overcome temptation. Flee temptation. Flee temptation. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Don't be tilted toward tragedy. Don't you be somebody else's illustration. Don't you be somebody else's tragic story of Felder because you got so close to living in sin that it didn't take too much to topple you off. How could a man be the father of his own grandchildren? All he had to do was pitch his tent towards Sodom. Would you bow your heads and pastor, would you come and give our invitation tonight? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.